All right, Halito, everyone. Welcome back to Chapter to Shirley. Um, Saho Chofo at Megan Baker. I'm a research associate here in historic preservation. And today I am joined by my fellow research associate, um, Jennifer Byram, who um, is my, I consider her like my co-conspirator, my other half, like the yin to my yang, because she does material culture and art stuff and I do documents and writing. <laughs> um, and so Jennifer is joining us from Tucson where she's a PhD student in archaeology at the University of Arizona. Um, Jennifer has also worked in this office um, doing textile work and she started a textile group that I'm sure some of you are a part of and they've together been learning learning from um, old documents and kind of different things to recreate Choctaw textiles. And that hasn't been done for hundreds of years and kind of doing it together. So Jennifer is gonna be sharing a little bit about that for us today. Um, so she has a PowerPoint for you. And so you can go ahead and take it away, Jennifer. All right, and thanks, Megan, for letting uh, textiles have the uh, spotlight um, for Chata Tisholi. Um, Obviously, Megan's been doing some awesome stuff, uh, sharing so many great speakers, so I'm definitely honored to be a part of that. Um, so I will go ahead and jump in because I, I would love to do some, um, let me see if I can, okay, hopefully. You guys can see the correct PowerPoint screen, correct? Yeah, I see your, your one, I think. Oh, no. <laughs> it always has to take <laughs> a second. Let me go ahead and I will share the screen. That way you can see the correct one. Um, sorry about that. All right. So um, I'll do some uh, demonstrations a little bit later, but we'll go ahead and jump in. So um, as Megan said, I've been working in the Historic Preservation Department for um, almost five years now. And um, I started uh, by doing some research into Choctaw textiles, which um, textiles have long been my passion, but I hadn't been able to really um, learn or uh, live in Oklahoma, live in Choctaw Nation growing up. So this was a really amazing opportunity for me to um, be able to connect with um, that side of my family and um, that heritage. And so I learned a lot from others like Ian Thompson and um, got started in, in looking at what are some of the native fibers in the Southeast and the Choctaw homelands. Um, what are some of the sources we can look at um, for Choctaw textiles? Because, um, you know, we see our our um, modern day Choctaw traditional dress, um, but kind of where, what did that look like hundreds of years ago? And actually for thousands of years, um, people have been making um, really amazing textiles um, all across the Southeastern United States. So, um, or Southeast North America. So, uh, Starting the Choctaw Textile Workshop Group um, in 2018 was really when that took off and, and being in a group of people with lots of different experience and we kind of uh, drew from each other's experience, had a lot of fun um, getting out into the land, collecting plants, working with dyes, um, learning to do different techniques that people, you know, some of us were familiar with, but using them in different ways than we had in the past. Um, on these native fibers and materials um, has been really rewarding. Um, and, you know, we've also been able to bring in different speakers, different artists, Southeastern artists. Um, and this is basket weaver, basket weaver Tom Colvin teaching us how to process bear grass um, that he had brought up to uh, Ian Thompson's. Um, Nanawaya Heritage Farmstead, and we had collected some dyes that day, and and it's really just um, to be able to see the magic of going from the plant to um, the fiber and to a finished product uh, is something that 
I think that not a lot of us have seen, and it's something that you learn just so much by going through that process. So some of the, the resources we can see Choctaw textiles in or Southeastern textiles are in the archeological record, but really textiles decay super fast. So we don't have a lot of direct resource, resources we can look at, but we can look at how um, textiles can be seen in actually pottery and ceramics. So um, this image on the right is an image from a Choctaw village site in the 1700s in Kemper County, Mississippi. And the lines you see across the clay there are actually from a twined cloth. Um, so we'll talk about what twining is in a second, but um, that's, that's um, just a, a piece of evidence that you see where textiles can be seen. Um, and then we also can look at old journals, um, as well as ways that um, we're still making things that that kind of echo older techniques, older designs. Um, and we also look all across the southeast because there's so few resources sometimes in the areas um, that we're looking at in Choctaw homelands that we kind of have to look at some of the shared techniques because there were there were a lot of shared techniques across the region. So this is one example of some of the, the sources we can look at for Choctaw textiles. And so this is um, from Beckham Village, Alabama, a Choctaw village, ancestral village site. And there are tons of shirts found there um, that were with um, textile impressions. So someone made, say, a pot or a bowl or a larger pan. So maybe they dug a hole in the ground, laid down like an old skirt, something that had been repaired, something that had been worn a lot. Um, and they repurposed it, laid the textile down over this hole they dug in the ground, formed a clay pot or vessel inside of that, then peeled the textile off um, and let that pot dry, fired it. And then um, you see the negative impression or the negative image of that textile. So today what some archeologists do is they take little casts or molds of that textile um, by pressing it on to the, the pottery shirt, and then they can see even indi individual fibers, but also the textile structure of the textile that somebody used to make that ceramic. So it's a really powerful tool for um, understanding just how common and how, how many textiles people were making. So um, just because we're not seeing like actual garments from that time period doesn't mean that people weren't making a lot of amazing pieces. Um, so here's another site, um, and you see like just a range of, of different um, textile structures, um, different weave structures that people were using um, at that site. So this one's a little bit later. This one back here is from about 500 to 1250 AD. So, but textiles go back much further. So this um, bag is from actually the year, I think, about zero. It used to be about 2,000 years old. And those little seeds you see um, below the, the bag right here are actually a, an ancestor of kind of, um, a, a, mm, can't think of the grain, but it's a grain we use, quinoa. There we go. Um, and it's actually full of those seeds. So it's really tightly woven, tightly packed, um, actually tightly twined bag and it's full of those seeds. And it was found in Arkansas, which is outside of Choctaw homeland, but it's the same materials, the same techniques we were using. So this bag is made of um, pawpaw bark and uh, rattlesnake master leaves. So bundled up leaves um, twined with the dark fibers are pawpaw bark. And so it's a really strong bag. And you think about like a Walmart sack is something we have, you know, we, we have lots of bags. It's like not something we think about, but people had to make those things to carry and hold things. So we also have examples of shoes across the Eastern United States. We can look at um, people didn't just wear moccasins. Um, actually plant fiber sh shoes are a little bit more hardy and um, provide more of a traction for like hiking and things. Um, so just to give you a reference, those types of pieces are made with a variety of different um, techniques. 
So different types of twining. And I can show you some examples a little bit later, but um, these are some of the structures that you see. So they can go from a little bit simpler, like A is that really basic structure, and then up to F, which is super complex, like really amazing kind of, if people are familiar with um, uh, bobbin lace from, from Europe, I mean, people confused uh, some of the, um, pieces from the archaeological record in the southeast with bobbin lace. Um, so really amazing complex structures could also be made with these techniques. Um, so women were the ones who were more um, associated with textiles. Usually they were made often with plant fibers, sometimes with animal fibers, but um, more often the ones who were making and wearing these textiles. And they make, they take so much time to make, it would really be kind of integral to your everyday life. Um, so you could sit and talk and um, have conversations with people while you're working with things, um, while you're processing dog bean. One of the plants we'll talk about in a second. Um, and we just think about the many uses we have in our lives today for textiles. Um, you know, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, you still needed textiles. So just lots of things we could make um, out of plant fibers, animal fibers um, for our everyday life. So here's a, an ensemble of what a 1700 Choctaw woman's um, clothing might look like. So you have the, the Ascona, which is the, the twine skirt, and you have a Cosmo here, which is a turkey feather cape. And that's got um, a base of, of twine fabric as well. Um, and so you think about all of the different things you have to consider throughout the year of trying to stay warm or not be too warm um, and the different types of clothing that people might wear um, to to signify if they're a leader or, um, you know, maybe somebody would make something to give um, to kind of form a relationship. So lots of different purposes. And um, just for reference, um, here's a Choctaw man's ensemble from that time period as well. So fewer textiles, but um, still, you know, there would be textiles in lots of different things we would use and make. Um, so this is actually a drawing from the mid 1700s of some uh, Natchez women. So um, they're, they're neighbors of Choctaws in that time period, but um, just showing this because it's really similar to what Choctaws would wear during this time period. So um, two of the women have trade cloth skirts in bright red and blue, and then one of the women is also wearing a turkey feather cape. Um, and then there's also a, a fringe plant fiber skirt there that um, another woman is wearing. So um, these are some of the kinds of kind of ways that people were incorporating new materials and combining them with old materials or or materials they were familiar with. Um, so, you know, as uh, over the last few hundred years, obviously the world has changed a lot. And, you know, in, in early 1800s up through, you know, the 1900s um, mission schools and boarding schools, um, children were learning different techniques. So this is actually a, a sampler that a Choctaw girl made um, from uh, the Mayhew um, uh, female mission school um, in about 18, about 1830, I guess, this particular piece is dated to June 9th, 1830. And so you think about um, the fact that people had lots of amazing textile skills and skills to make things, but they could also um, apply those skills in other ways to different materials. Um, and so it just attests back to the many generations of, of makers and artists going before them. And um, these are some other examples of um, <clears throat> pieces that we're using you know, new materials or American, you know, Euro-American materials. So trade cloth to, to uh, make bandolier sashes, which we see today as well. Um, and those sashes are actually from Louisiana, uh, as well as um, this Wheelock sampler set um, that uh, a student made that is actually using some of the same finger weaving techniques that we see um, going back hundreds and thousands of years um, in the archaeological record. So um, these are definitely old techniques that, that have stuck around. Um, and so here's also some drawings of some Choctaw men in the 1830s. And um, one of them, the, the man on the left, um, 
Jamie or, or James, he has actually, it's hard to see, but he's got garters on his um, leggings there. And so, you know, holding up his leggings and those could be made with finger weaving, the same kind that we just saw in the sampler right here on, on the left. So um, these techniques are kind of all over. You've got another pair of garters there with leggings. Um, so uh, lots of ways that these could be used um, for men and women, um, even as materials changed, even as we were making different, different items. So I'm just going through these a little quicker because I want to make sure we get to the fibers themselves, but um, just to kind of remind us of how um, we see those uh, different techniques um, kind of changing, but also uh, staying the same in, in, in different ways. So we also see Choctaw, um, like older words in, in like the, the Cyrus Byington Dictionary, for example, um, where there's words that kind of go back further to um, older textile techniques, but also like changing textiles that um, people, you know, there's this, this um, Choctaw definer with all of these really complex Choctaw words for different parts of um, looms and spinning wheels, which is really impressive. And it just shows that people were talking about these things and making lots of, of different um, types of textiles. So throughout the 17, 18, in early 1900s. Um, so you have words like um, api, um, and that's the word for a warp. So that's the the yarns that go lengthwise on a cloth. And that's also a word for um, stalk or stem of a plant. So um, that actually seems to have a lot of meaning because it kind of indicates that maybe the length of your plant could also be the length of your textile, or it could be, you know, thinking about um, using a piece of bark um, for your work. So, there are ways to think about how maybe these textiles were made by Choctaw people um, in the past at different times. So um, these are just some examples from other parts of the world. We don't have a lot of records of specifically um, tools in the Southeast. There's not a ton of them, but these are some spindles that would be similar to the descriptions of Choctaw spindles um, or Southeastern spindles used for spinning yarn. And um, people could also use a loom like this on the right. Um, this is actually from a, a different region, um, from a, a Chippewa woman's loom. But stick looms would definitely be something that's easy to make, easy to adjust for different projects, um, and easy to move. Um, so that's that's uh, really actually that convenience is super nice. So um, simple tools, but it means that you have to be extremely skilled, but then you're also very flexible and making lots of different types of pieces and garments and um, for whatever projects you're working on. And people could put shells on um, their clothing or beads or um, later like tin bells. Um, there's some porcupine quills sometimes. So um, all sorts of ways of making people's um, clothing unique and different, different colors and dyes. We'll get to that in a second. And so the different types of fibers you get in the southeast, um, you have uh, bison hair that could be traded in and was in the southeast for, for a few hundred years, um, as well as some other fibers that are talked about, but we're not totally sure um, how often, you know, rabbit hair or possum hair would be used. But you have lots of um, plant fibers. So um, dogbane is one that we'll talk about. Um, milkweed and nettle are very similar. And you might have these near you and you might not know. So some of these are really found widespread across North America. So dogbane is, as is um, nettle and milkweed. Um, red mulberry is another good source for fiber, um, but something that is a little bit, um, we're still kind of trying to figure out how, how people in the Southeast were using it. Um, there's also leaf fibers. So rattlesnake master is one, um, pawpaw bark, bear grass is another leaf fiber as is yucca. So um, this is a picture on the right of um, dogbane and you have the old growth that's the darker 
um, stock there. And then you have the younger um, growth is on the right with the bright green leaves. And you actually get dogbane when um, it's, it's uh, you know, like late fall or early spring. It's really resistant to rot. And you don't want to mess with a sap because uh, that's toxic. But when the sap dries out, you can use it. Um, and this is something that uh, it's also called Indian hemp or Choctaw root sometimes, and people could use it to make like clothing. Um, and it is in early records, and this is really widely available. So you might be able to find it. Um, and even if you're living in a different part of the country, um, still work with a Choctaw material. And, um, and it might grow a different way than in the homelands, but you can kind of get the idea of the types of um, fibers people are working with. So you also got bison hair, and um, women were using that to um, sometimes make shot pouches, actually, in the 1700s. Um, and you could make, like, people were making beaded um, designs, um, so stringing beads onto their warp, onto their um, bison hair yarn, and then weaving designs into the fabric. So you can make sashes this way. Um, bags, so a really um, incredible, like very warm fiber. And today, it's it's if you look for bison yarn, it's super expensive. So it's something we have to think about a little bit differently. Um, spinning it um, the way people were spinning in the past and and processing these fibers is a little bit different than the way modern textile artists work. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then you've got mulberry bark. Um, I can't get into this too much right now, but um, that's a really amazing fiber that we're still learning about. And people have used um, mulberry bark, you know, in lots of different parts of the world um, in different ways. So like in Hawaii, um, for example, and it's, it's, um, a white fiber and so people were really struck by that in the 1700s when Choctaws and um, Europeans met. Um, the Europeans were really amazed by Choctaw clothing or southeastern um, native clothing because it was something that um, was just really beautiful and and really strong, um, very sturdy, and so people were using it for all different types of um, purposes. And so there are these accounts from the 1700s of how people were um, using it, but it's a little bit hard to follow a 1700s recipe. So we're, we're still working with that. Um, so some native dyes that um, you might be able to use or you might be able to find. So black walnut is a common one that makes a nice dark brown or, you know, depending on how you boil it, it could make a lighter color or a darker color. You can also use bodark um, to get like an orange or yellow. Um, and you can also, this is not a dye, but you can also use pigments and paint them onto textiles. Um, and so that, that you can create different designs by doing that. Um, and then later on, people were trading for dyes um, like indigo and madder. <clears throat> so some of the dyes in the southeast, like very commonly, are yellow or darker brown or black. Um, but there's also some other recipes, like for getting red, where you combine like a, a yellow dyed cloth and you you paint some. Um, like you, you put a paste on top with wood ash and water and it'll change the color to red um, because it's changing the pH of, of um, with the added paste on there. Um, and so there's, there's different ways that people were getting different colors. Um, and these are more traditional, you know, white, black, yellow, and red, more traditional colors anyway. So um, lots of different ways to get these colors. And sometimes you can even use plants in your yard to um, kind of experiment, but um, you just have to make sure you're, you're using like safe um, ways of doing that. So there's lots of ways you can research some of that online and I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, so here's a, a workshop we did on um, dyes a couple years ago with um, Tom Colvin up from Louisiana. We use sassafras there on the left on the bottom and then black walnut holes there on the top uh, left. So you can see how dark that color is. Um, and so actually about a year and a half ago now, we had the opportunity to make a skirt with the um, textile workshop group 
uh, for the cultural center. And so we were excited about this opportunity to actually not just use the fibers to create yarn, but to finally um, make a, a full garment. And it took us hundreds of hours. So it was really great to do it as a group and we all got to learn from it, but we also got to pool our time and resources because obviously um, we're not living in the exact same way that we were hundreds of years ago. So we may not have time to create um, garments from the plant or from the fiber all the way to the finished garment all the time. But um, when we have the opportunity, it was it was a really valuable experience. So we based it on this description of a Choctaw um, clothing from the 1700s by a, an anonymous French chronicle, chronicler. And so he describes uh, some articles of bison wool, which the women spin, um, and they make garters, they dye them, um, but they also make a fabric partly of, of bison wool and partly of like a, a plant fiber, um, which they're spinning up and um, the fabric is doubled and it's thick. And so he also gives a dimension in an old style of um, measurement. It's about 45 inches is an L. So it, it gives a pretty specific measurement and it's a skirt. So we were able to use this really um, valuable description to base the skirt off of. And we use the um, the design there, the, the twining techniques that you can see in the corner um, to create the um, structure of the skirt. So um, we ended up making 420 meters of dog bane yarn, two ply dog bane yarn, and 260 meters of two ply bison hair yarn. So that actually took the bulk of the time. So that takes just hundreds of hours just to make process the fibers and make the yarn. And so lots of different people jumped in and helped. So there um, on the right, you see some uh, brushing out. The, the bison hide, um, we actually um, cut up the hide and soaked it in water and wood ash to get the hair um, off of the hide and pulled it off. And it kind of made the fiber a little bit easier to spin actually, um, give it a little bit more grab. And then you have to wash it. There's lots of dirt in bison hides uh, or in bison hair, and then sort it out because you have lots of different types of bison hair on one animal. And so you wanted the short, fine, um, soft and warm bison hair for, for this skirt. Um, and then we um, you have to kind of brush out and wash it a lot, get all of that dirt out and get it ready to spin. And um, for the dog bane, I'll talk about what that looks like in a second, um, but that was a lot of processing time. So we harvested some dog bane in Oklahoma, but also in um, Illinois, where um, I actually grew up and happened to find um, a whole bunch of dog bane there. And the Arboretum uh, near where I grew up uh, allowed us to use that um, dog bane for this project. And um, so they provided quite a bit for us to, um, to work with and to learn on. And so um, we then also used um, bison hair from some that was shed, but mostly from the hide that I was talking about earlier. And um, there on the right, you can see the stages of dog bane processing. So you have the stock, then you go to, break it down to the fiber, then you spin it up into one strand, and then you ply those two strands together so it's a stronger yarn. Um, it doesn't hold up well to kind of friction. Um, so if you make a mistake and you have to go back, it actually kind of sometimes could break. So you have to be really careful with your materials and make sure you're using it well. So it's just another testament to the fact that people who were making these um, textiles in the past were really experts. They knew what they were doing and they knew how to work with the materials and and we're learning. So we're getting there, but we're not um, we're not on their level yet. And then you have this really lovely um, bison yarn on the left that we made for the skirt. And it was hard to cut that because you didn't want to make any mistakes because it took so much time just to get that material. 
Um, so everyone really pitched in a lot to, to make these. So here we have um, the sample up on the top left of what we wanted to, as we were trying to figure out how to make the skirt, how to um, set it up. And then on the bottom um, left, you have the skirt coming together as um, Sandra Riley is twining it there. And then you have um, on the right, we're finishing up the skirt and um, getting the, the waistband done. So um, lots of different stages and it all takes more time than you think. Um, but really a rewarding experience. So um, Sandra was the one who twined both sides of the skirt and um, we learned a lot in that process just with um, trying to make sure that the skirt would come out to the right size, that it would fit the, the um, where it's gonna be in the cultural center, that um, things that tension is right, that's one of the biggest things with weaving. So the structures in, in these textiles are simpler, but that just means you have to be really skilled when you work with it so that it, it comes out well in the end. Um, and for all of us, this was a really amazing experience to work with these materials and to think about our ancestors who were these artists coming up with these techniques and, and using them in, in amazing ways. Um, so really skilled, skilled people to figure this out. Um, and so we, we learned a lot along the way. These are some other, on the left, some other pieces we were making for the cultural center. And so learning to do things like, like what does it look like when you paint um, with like a pigment or a dye on a twine textile and using different types of fibers um, and how to get the, the cloth to look right? How does it drape on a body? So these are things that we were learning kind of on the go. Um, so we're, you know, they're not perfect, but they're amazing um, examples of, of how our group um, worked together to, to make these pieces. Um, and then another story, Debbie's actually on a call um, or on this, uh, uh, this call right now, but she was um, spinning a lot of the bison hair and she didn't like to use a drop spindle. So instead she used what is sometimes called a Mayan spinner. And it looks pretty much exactly like this tool here you see on the right um, that was being used by Al an Alabama Cushada person to spin Spanish moss um, in the early 1900s. So um, we didn't know that that tool was also something that people in the Southeast were using. Um, but then you see that like our neighbors um, in the Southeast were using a, the same kind of tool. So it's just um, that, you know, reproducing or, or recreating some of these techniques and some of these, um, some of these pieces allow us to learn a lot about what kind of tools work for this, what kind of fibers, how do you process it? And, and it's not enough to just kind of um, to read it um, because really working with the materials you learn from them. And, um, you know, we don't, we're not experts, we're not um, the artists um, in the past who made them, but we can, we can learn through these pieces. Um, and so this is the finished bison hair dog bane skirt. Um, and it's just something that we're, we're so proud to share and to, um, to, to learn from this process and to have this in the cultural center so other people can learn from it as well. And um, to think about just the incredible pieces people were, were making um, and clothing that people were wearing in, in, in the past. And um, this skirt is so warm. It's really luxurious. It's um, something that I think people would find beautiful to wear today as well. And so, um, I think we want to keep making things and keep learning um, through this group, through these projects. So here are some other textiles that we worked with that year. Um, there's a, you know, a skirt that we used um, shell bead applique on, um, a skirt that we painted with red ochre and um, black walnut hole dye. Um, and uh, Sarah de Herrera made this amazing turkey feather cape um, there's a sash all made from dog bane and, and dyed with black walnut holes, as well as trying to make tools that might match that story.
still learning, still trying to kind of um, get some of the tools right, but um, learning through all of these. And, and so it's training for us because we get to um, kind of get better at these techniques and learn through through working with the materials and looking at the earlier descriptions and trying to match kind of what people were doing with those. Um, and then, you know, at Labor Day, we had some pieces in there um, that year in 2019 that kind of were in line with some of the work we had been doing throughout the year. So um, I would love to see more people working with these techniques um, and incorporating them in new ways um, because, you know, that's what we've always done is talk to people, is, um, uh, really think through things and incorporate some of um, the materials we have on hand and kind of respond to um, the world that we're in. Um, and we've also still been meeting online, even during the pandemic. Um, Margaret Riley made this really awesome trio of masks to represent different um, time periods in Choctaw clothing and history. And um, we're continuing to meet and bring in speakers and talk to people and learn from what they're doing, different artists in the Southeast um, and archaeologists, um, botanists. So just to kind of learn as much as we can and continue to grow and learn in, in um, the Choctaw textiles and, and arts. So um, one thing we did that year as we were trying to make all of these pieces is we actually did a, a twining retreat. And so we um, went to the home of uh, the grandmother of, or grandparents of Leslie Widener and Celia Meadows, and they were gracious enough to host us. And we worked on the, the skirts together and um, working on processing still materials for the bison dog vein skirt, but also these other skirts we made out of, of um, stinging nettle yarn. And Leslie writes about that experience in a really beautiful way. She says, my grandmother, Eva Alton Hale, would have loved having her house full of this talented group of Choctaw women. Decades ago, my grandmother and her friends spent long afternoons in the front room quilting from a frame that was lowered from the ceiling. In June 2019, cars of women arrived and unloaded food and supplies at my family's historic home on our Choctaw allotment. They hung horizontal poles from hooks along the covered front porch and on the backs of chairs. These women also joined in laughter, conversation, and stories as they spun dogbane and buffalo wool into yarn and twined it into the skirts and sashes that seemed to appear as if by magic. Um, and I, I couldn't really say it better. Uh, the experience of working together on something um, with a group of Choctaw women was um, something that I think felt so natural um, to be working together on these things, to think about um, spaces where Choctaw women would have done that in the past, helped each other out, shared materials, shared dyes, um, gathered things, worked on spinning together as they sat and maybe watched um, the field or children. And, and um, I think you see those in, those stories and those spaces in different times in Choctaw history. And so just getting to um, sit there and kind of be a part of that um, was really an honor for us all. Um, so thank you for, for coming and, and being interested in Choctaw textiles. And actually I'd like um, to go ahead and I'll stop sharing. And um, I'm gonna pull out some, some materials that I have with me some samples and if there are any questions, Megan can um, jump in and, and take those while I just go ahead and show you some different um, fibers. I wish that everyone could um, see these in person and touch them because that's also how you, you learn through this. Um, but uh, hopefully um, someday soon, in the past we've been at Labor Day and had some of these things out for people to look at. So hopefully in the future, we'll get to do that again. So real quick, I'm going to just show you um, a piece of dog bane that I have here. This is actually from uh, the Arboretum in Illinois, and it's really tall for dog bane. So in Oklahoma, you, you don't get dog bane quite this um, size. And um, the soil is really different. I think this dog bean might be a little bit more similar to what we might have had in, in the homelands, but unfortunately I, I haven't worked with dog bean from the Choctaw homelands yet. But um, 
So this is this is pretty impressive. The dog bin you get in Oklahoma is more like four feet and a little bit skinnier, but you can still definitely use it. And I would definitely keep an eye out. So I'm gonna switch my video here and um, show you how it's processed. So um, let's see, make sure you guys can see. So here I've got my stock and normally I might break this up with something else, but um, this works just as well with my hands. So I'm just cracking it all along the length of the stock. And actually, I wish that um, Megan had some right now because I could uh, walk her through that so you could see um, someone who's, who's just learning how to process dog bane and what that um, looks like. But um, I'm sure she would appreciate not having bark in her keyboard. <laughs> so um, I'll let her get away this time. So what I was doing is, um, so dog vein is hollow. So I was just um, kind of smashing the, the stock. You can use a shell or, um, you know, a rock or something, but you don't want anything too hard or else it'll um, cut the fibers. So you can see the bottom of the stock here was a little bit um, too, too rotted, probably closer to the ground, a little bit more damp. Dog bean's really resistant to rot, but sometimes um, some stocks you get might have been out in um, outside for you know maybe two years, and so it might not be as strong. Um, so what I'm doing right now is I'm taking out the inside of the stock. So I'm taking out this core, and what we want is this fiber right here. So this is the fiber we're looking for, and we can make cordage out of it. Um, another way to process it is you can take um, the stalks and you can leave it in the dew or in water um, until it's kind of it's kind of a controlled rotting process. And um, if you're doing it in the dew, it won't happen as fast. But if you're doing it in the water, it'll happen sometimes in a matter of weeks. It's a little bit slower if it's cold outside and you have it outdoors. Um, and that just makes it so that the bark separates from the fibers a little bit easier. So the, some of this stuff has actually been outside um, for a little while, so it may actually be somewhat rutted already. So just to show you, as I break that off, um, the bark can kind of come off, but it might not come off right away. So we might have to kind of scrunch it up a little bit like that. So you can start to see the fibers come in pretty well there. So hopefully you guys are seeing this. So this is a similar technique to what you might use for um, processing milkweed, uh, also stinging nettle, um, and uh, some of the others like pawpaw bark and mulberry bark have to be done a different, a little bit of a different way. So, um, but this one, you know, you can kind of do it pretty quickly just as I'm doing this here. And um, just keep working with it until you kind of go up the entire length of the stock. So um, I'm going to brush that aside for the moment, but I can come back to it if people want to see that a little bit more. And I'm going to show you a big bundle of fiber I have. So this is a lot of hours of just taking fiber off of the stock. So this takes lots of time. But um, it is very rewarding um, in the end, although sometimes you kind of, uh, it's more fun to do when you have other people around. So I know Leslie and some of the others, people would do this kind of while they're sitting and talking to people, um, you know, enjoying someone's company so that you're not kind of sitting there um, doing it by yourself. And I, I think that, Choctaw people in the past would have done the same because, um, you know, you could do this 
while you're doing all sorts of things. So um, there's an account of um, older Choctaw women sitting in a, kind of a, a scaffold, watching the plants and making sure that nobody, you know, animals or, you know, kids weren't getting into them, um, messing with things. And yeah, I could, I could see um, them sitting and processing dog bane. So what I'm doing here is I've got some cord that I made up uh, a few weeks ago um, with some dog bane. And so I'm just going to show you a little bit about what it um, looks like when you're hand twisting cordage. Um, just be, <laughs> if you can't quite tell what's going on, there's always lots of good videos you can look up on YouTube on how to do this, but you can also come to um, a class. Uh, so we, we've we been holding online textile workshops. And um, if you want to um, contact me or join the um, Facebook group, the um, Facebook group is called Choctaw Traditional Textiles. Um, and you can join that uh, as well and just uh, keep up with um, some of the upcoming workshops. Um, and we can talk about um, some of these processes a little bit more. So what I'm doing here is I'm making a two ply cord or, or yarn. Um, and so I'm twisting. You can twist both of the plies, but you kind of have to keep the yarn in place with one hand. So I'm keeping the yarn in place, keeping the twist in place. And I'm twisting one group of fibers, twisting the other group of fibers, and then twisting them the opposite direction. So twist and twist the opposite direction together. So um, if you've ever kind of taken apart a piece of yarn, you might have seen kind of what that looks like kind of um, in the opposite direction. So um, this fiber can be used for making skirts, could be make, used for making bags, belts, um, with all sorts of things even shoes. So let me um, show you some other fibers real quick and then we'll see if we have any questions. So just to give you a quick visual, um, this may be backwards. I think this is backwards. So I'll wait till I sh switch to my other camera to show you that because <laughs> it's a little bit backwards. But here's a sample of the bison dog bane um, twine that we made before making the skirt just to see kind of the size of, of how things would come out. So this is actually doubled. So it's quite thick um, in the actual finished skirt. And you see um, some of our textile group members um, were the ones that um, spun up and processed this um, bison hair. So I think it was Laura who did this one. Um, and then we have some fibers. So this is a, a roll of mulberry bark. So at some point we'll get to we'll get to process that, but sometimes you can just you can um, strip the mulberry bark off the strip or off the off the stalk um, off of younger shoots or branches. And then you can let it dry um, and then rehydrate it at a later time to start working with it. Um, but that technique we kind of haven't perfected. So um, you can also work with bear grass leaves. So this is some, some fiber from um, bear grass leaves. This is a, a really strong fiber and it's a little bit hardier kind of strength wise um, and uh, kind of holding up to friction and things than dog bane is. Um, so that's a fiber you get in the southeast. Another really amazing fiber is um, pawpaw bark. And this was um, uh, given to me, so I actually didn't process this, but um, it's got this sheen, really beautiful sheen. Um, and it's almost like kind of ribbon. Um, and this is, uh, you get these different layers from um, uh, the bark of pawpaw trees that come out um, when you redden ret and process it. So retting is that controlled rotting process. Um, and just a couple more. Here's some mulberry bark yarn that I did. Um, it has a little bit of a kind of heathered color to it. Um, and part of that was just that some of the fiber when I was um, retting it, um, it turned brown a little bit. So 
that's why it's not, not as white as the, the new fiber. So um, kind of an unintentional effect, but mulberry bark is also really very strong, but it's a little bit harder um, to work with. So this is another sample of twining that we did. And this one is um, painted with red ochre here and then black walnut hull dye here. So um, that's a, a really wonderful dye to work with and one that you can just collect the black walnuts um, when they fall and then um, boil them in water. Um, and if you use a cast iron pot, the, the color will get even darker, but you might want to use something you're not actually eating out of. So that's just a consideration. Um, when you're using dyes, you, you don't really want to use um, tools that you're, you're eating with um, when you cook the dyes. So, um, and then we use some shell beads on one of the skirts. Um, so I think, um, Megan, are there any questions while I go there through? There are questions. There are oh, many. Great. Bring the questions. All right, do you want to flip your camera? I will do that. Yes. <laughs> so messy. So glad that's not on my desk. <laughs> I am I am disappointed, but um, next time we'll have Megan processing some dog bait for you all. Um, I think it was like one of the first times I met Jennifer, it was at Labor Day and she was like, they had set up the, the dog bean to kind of process it. And she's like, do you want to try it? And I was like, oh no. <laughs> to make credit, credit, she, she comes to all our talk talk textile workshops and she learns a lot. I, I think, well, we learned from her too. So, um, it's great having her on and she's going to talk about Choctaw women as, as like the makers and artists of, um, these textiles. So, um, so I'm very, uh, thankful that we get to be such a, a team on all of this. So good. Yeah, and that's and I think that's one of the really big things for me is like um the this kind of artisan work is so important to our early Choctaw economies and it really and the fact that Choctaw women were the makers and um artists behind it are shows us how they have such political force within our societies and how integral their work was. And mm -hmm. a lot of times mm -hmm. people view textile arts, traditional arts as just kind of, oh, cool cultural things, but those are really the core of our economies and our political systems. And I think that gets kind of lost, especially yeah. Yeah. you have women not being seen as political authorities because of colonialism and kind of all of those things. And so that's kind of why I really love textiles, even if I don't do it myself with my own hands. No, it's a really great point. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think um, is maybe surprising to people is that in like our treaties, um, in negotiations with people, um, you could tell like women were very much a part of that because they're like in the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, among other treaties, there there are like looms and um, spinning wheels, like as part of um, the negotiations is the people wanted those um, to be um, kind of as, you know, not payment's not the right word, but people were um, uh, asking for these things. And this is a part of like, um, women were making things and selling them and, and trading um, so that they could um, get access to what they were looking to get access to. So absolutely a great point that um, this is definitely something that um, was empowering, you know, um, that people were, were working with in very savvy ways. Yeah, it's you have to like read in between the lines of what's kind of important because there's so many biases within historical records, what gets kind of documented and you know, like people explorers were kind of less interested in that. And so I think that's also why it's kind of so hard to find the descriptions and all of that. But it's like through Jennifer's presentation, I hope you guys can all kind of see how much work and research is kind of behind this work. It's pouring over old handwritten archival documents mm -hmm. and trying to glean any 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 clause mention of these kinds of things and then turning it into these things 
that are like now in our cultural center that we haven't done for hundreds of years. And that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, I mean, to our knowledge, no one's kind of made this kind of skirt in over 200 years. And so, um, and I think it really takes like drawing from all these different resources and then making it, pulling it together to learn, okay, this didn't actually work. And this person, maybe they didn't realize what they were looking at when they were writing that down. But I think um, by working together on that, um, we were able to learn a lot and bring something to light that, um, that we couldn't, we could only see in glimpses and kind of fragments. And so putting that together and, and looking at, okay, um, people were make, you know, making some amazing things, wearing some amazing things and doing amazing things with it. Um, and, you know, we know that, but to see it, I think um, is really powerful. Yeah, it's like watching Jennifer struggle with this little thing. I was like, oh man, I couldn't do that. That's really, that's some knowledge. And it's like real scientific knowledge um also of the land of the plants their property yeah, um yeah. so like in her her group she'll have scientists kind of come on and i think that's like crazy you have people who are like are in labs and do things like that and mm -hmm. like, those are the kinds of people that's the kind of knowledge that we don't know that we're trying to also reclaim um and just if anyone's interested in reading more um so uh you know with kind of all of this and all we're working on together um there's a couple of resources that i'm happy to share with you um and and like there's lots of places that you can look to kind of learn about this if you want to get involved um and so there's some you know free papers and different things like that that um i'm you know happy to share so and real quick, while we're at it, now that my video is turned around, <laughs> here's just a little um, kind of mulberry bark as a stalk. Um, and then like what the bark looks like. So it's all curled up and dried up top, but here's the white inside of the bark. And here's some fiber and here it is like spun up into a really fine cordage. And then there, dog bane, just so you can kind of see in a different view, there's a short kind of piece of a stalk. Um, a piece of split bark and then taking the inside out. I know it's hard to see with some of this, which is again why we just need to <laughs> do this in, in person someday when uh, it's not a, a global pandemic. But um, working with the materials is something that I think, you know, and, and realizing just how rich people's knowledge of the land um, was and, and how they were able to um, use what they had um, to make amazing things. And then you think about um, removal and moving to um, Choctaw territory in modern Oklahoma. And um, you don't know where your gathering spots like are gone now and you, you have to kind of um, figure out where to get your resources again. And people were still using native dyes in, in Oklahoma and in Choctaw territory. So they were, um, using that knowledge in new ways and new places and and um, kind of uh, making new pieces. And so um, there are kind of different echoes of all of these things that continue on in, um, yeah, as people were kind of creatively responding to their situation. So. Uh, we can jump into these questions. Yes. So Pierce yeah. wants to know, do you know if there were any unique textile techniques historically associated with different Choctaw communities? Is it possible that communities in living in areas like six towns had their own district style of making textiles, but other communities living in the homeland might, might recognize? Wow, that is a great question. <laughs> Pierce, um, I will have to go back and look. I think there might have been, you know, I know that there are certain descriptions like of Choctaw women and like six towns, you know, wearing um, different, you know, they have different, I think, tattooing or, um, and I, you know, don't quote me on this because this is, you know, well, the look back at the sources, but I, I bet there were, but um, I think we'd have to go back and really compare that. And that's something I haven't looked into because a lot of times I'm casting a pretty wide net and um, to, to kind of understand the general techniques. And then I think designs, you know, you might have to kind of trace back in a different way. So there's a lot of things that are shared across the region, but then specific designs and like what makes a Choctaw um, piece of clothing and then what makes a piece of clothing that would identify someone from one region and another 
I, I have to believe that that would definitely be the case and people learn in one town, often people learn from each other. And so you have in one site, everybody's spinning their yarn the same way. And so um, I haven't looked for that as to far as like what um, districts, Choctaw districts were doing, but that would be a great project to do in the future. In a similar vein, Ryan wants to know um, what work still needs to be done in revitalizing our um, textiles. Um, that's a great question. I think I've mentioned this multiple times, but mulberry bark is something that um, people have asked about, um, but I haven't worked with it enough um, to get the, the processing technique down. And one thing I think we just have to keep doing is keep working with the materials because we can produce something, but sometimes we're not as efficient and we're not um, people that have grown up learning from experts. Um, and so I think we need to keep talking to different um, indigenous artists in different parts of the world who are working with similar materials and see if, if they're using it in a way that would be similar to how people were using it in the Southeast and kind of um, just do the, the science behind um, refining those techniques and getting it so that we can understand the fiber better and um, have more reliable results when we're trying to process it because not all of us have access to these resources all the time so we want to be able to to use the resources we have um, well and and uh, yeah and and it's easier to share and and teach people and get people started when you have uh, that process down a little bit easier so I wish there were there's more, there are, I wish there were more of us. So there's always a need for more hands. I feel like that's everything. There needs to be more Choctaws doing more things Choctaw, very specifically. Would love that, would make my job so much easier. Yeah. Um, and then Ryan also asks, um, what are your recommendations to encourage our native youth to continue these artistic traditions? How can we make it relevant to their daily lives? That's a great question and one that I ask a lot um, of, you know, how is this relevant? And sometimes it's hard to imagine um, how can we make things that take hundreds of hours when you only have so much time to do something. But um, there's two things with that. One, um, so a few years ago, we um, processed dog bane um, with the Choctaw Youth Camp in the summer. Then the, then the next year, we did a twine bag. And I have to say that working with um, youth, it is amazing how people are just as skilled at that age as adults. And um, you can tell how some people can just like, get to what they need to do and they just like have a lot of innate talent for doing that and understand it. So I think one thing um, is that youth um, are just as capable of jumping in and learning these techniques and becoming really skilled at them. And, and so these are great techniques for anyone to learn. Um, and to take on and there's a lot of knowledge there that you don't even realize you're picking up while you work with it so um i think that's that's really empowering just to realize that this is a great art to jump in and work on and it's something you can do with other people and sit and kind of um, be in community and that's also a wonderful thing which we all know right now um is really precious is to spend time with other people working on these things so i think in today's world, sometimes having something um, when you're sitting together, whether you're sitting with your grandparent or um, sitting with your siblings and working on something like that, um, it's it's a really valuable time to just share together um, and and to to sit together and, and talk and share stories and make something while you're doing it. But then, you know, I think working with the textile group. Um, we can pool our resources and time and do that and come together as a community and still make things. Even if each of us individually can't do all of the steps, we can see that come together. So I think that is where um, it's still possible in our busy lives to, to uh, work in, in this area. 
Um, and then one more thing is that um, we listened to a talk by an amazing Hawaiian artist who talked about how um, older Hawaiian arts maybe don't have the same meanings or um, places where we can use these um, pieces um, because they don't have the same kind of community structure, leadership structure that they had in the past, but they're finding new ways to honor people by making pieces for them, like in positions of leadership or um, recognizing um, what people are doing or um, using it for education. So I think there are new ways that we can use, like think about using these pieces, which like the bison skirt, I don't know that any one of us could necessarily wear a skirt that took hundreds of hours to make and a whole group of people, um, you know, our fingers <laughs> went into that. We had bark all over our houses for months, you know, um, but I think, you know, the fact that it's in the cultural center and everyone can learn from it and appreciate it. Um, that's a, a great way to be able to use some of these things as, um, as art um, with lots of intention in, into it to, to, to um, go back to our community. But um, I'm also all ears if people have new ideas of how to use these things. Um, Sandra threw in that we could plant our own patches of dog bean <laughs> and yes. maybe we could make friendship bracelets. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Prague. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Jamie, who is a Choctaw from Idaho, she says, did the Choctaw ever use sheep wool in their clothing like the Navajo? Um, so you do get some accounts from like uh so the Indian pioneer papers um from the earlier, like the 1930s. Um people talk about um their mothers or grandmothers having them sit and like card wool or um their mothers making like mittens or weaving. So um, people were definitely like working with sheep's wool during the 1800s um, and as well as cotton, um, but not in the same way that Navajo um, weavers are using it. So um, I would say it was definitely used, but that's something that we haven't really found a lot of examples of. So we'll have to keep doing research and um, seeing, you know, maybe if there are different styles of how talk dogs were using wool, but they were definitely making and selling, um, selling clothing they were uh, making out of cotton and wool in the 1800s. Um, Deborah also asked if anyone's looked at trade lists about things that were imported and if you knew anything about that. Sandra knows a lot about that. Um, <laughs> so Sandra needs to jump on. Um, I know that she's talked about um, like swan feathers being traded. There's definitely, you know, lots of, um, you know, accounts of, uh, of course, beads, um, uh, trade cloth, so red, blue, shroud. Um, but uh, something that I think we, I would like to um, work with Sandra to um, pull together maybe a talk or some research and kind of get a better idea of what that looks like more kind of broadly and more consistently because um, we know that people were trading stuff and making lots of new things with what they were trading and working with. Um, so lots of red and blue um, trade cloth. I think you, you see that um, in accounts and, kind of all over um, the region as well. So um, something else we should work on. <laughs> um, Matt is also in the textile group. She wants to know when we can meet in person again, what's the next big project for the group? <laughs> that is a great question. I look forward to meeting in person again when, when we can. I am really looking forward to the opening of the Cultural Center when hopefully um, people will be able to see these textiles on display. Um, I don't know when we'll get to meet in person, but um, you know, certainly Maddie, if you want to host some, <laughs> some textile meetings um, in person, I would love that um, there in Oklahoma. But, uh, you know, I think that doing another skirt would be awesome, doing another twined skirt and processing the fiber um, and kind of pooling our resources again. That was a really great experience that um, I think learning from all stages and then also being able to have a finished product that 
I think sometimes it's hard to imagine how all of this comes together. Um, and so being able to make more examples of that um, for us all to learn from um, would be would be really fun. So uh, we have our work cut out for us. So yeah, yeah, Maddie, if you want to jump in on <laughs> helping to make a, a big skirt, um, I think that we could probably um, not a lot of people are doing that, so I think that we could probably uh, find some people who would be interested, maybe some, you know, museums or something, but uh, we'll have to talk about it, dream big, and see where we can go with it. Um, that's kind of all the questions that we have. Um, of course, all of this is being recorded and it's going to be posted on the Chata Tisholi webpage, which is on the Choctaw cultural services website, which is chachanationculture.com, I think. Um, and so one of the links has um, Chata Tusholi. And so all of the um, events are recorded there. So you can access this at a later date there. Send this to your friends. You can be like, we should learn how to make a skirt together. Send. So you can round up all your friends for Jennifer. <laughs> Well, and that's one uh, one thing. Another way to think about um, how you can make pieces without having to make like everything, every step of the way, um, is you can um, you can buy yarn that is similar to um, fibers in the you know native fibers of the southeast, and you can make your own skirt or top. I would love to see some people walking around with. Like, you know, Sandra's always talked about making like a, a twined top with shells on it. So how cool would it be to see people at Labor Day wearing um, you know, older Choctaw style clothing? So you have the applique, the diamond dresses alongside twine clothing. Um, so uh, this is some um, uh, stingy nettle yarn. Um, so women in the Himalayas in um, Nepal still make um, stinging nettle yarn. And it's hand spun. You can definitely tell it's hand spun by different women because it's kind of got the the properties of <laughs> hand spun yarn. Um, it's thick and thin sometimes. It's definitely got like little bits of bark every once in a while, which is all good quality. It's just normal hand spun stuff. But you can order it online, and you could make a skirt out of the same kind of plant that you can find in the southeast without necessarily having to go to um, the hundreds of hours that it takes to work with it. Um, and it's pretty affordable and you can find it on Etsy. So you can also get um, commercial hemp, um, you can make bags out of that clothing. So there are other ways to get about it without um, having to do the whole step, the whole process. And I think, you know, that's a very reasonable way to, to use these um, materials and techniques um, and also still have uh, that kind of finished product to, to be um, excited about. Um, people are also like making turkey turkey feather capes or goose feather capes and, and you know finding ways to get those feathers and work them in. Um, and uh, so there's there's not just one way to go about it. Um, and so you'll actually, you know, find there's there's more people who are interested in kind of working with this than you think out there. And and I think, um, you know, with more creative minds at work, we'll be able to kind of come up with more solutions and and ways to kind of um, make some new things with it. So. Um, I think that yeah, that's all I had. Um, there's another. Um, I could actually grab a little textile, clary textile impression real quick if that anyone's interested. This was actually fired for me by um, Laura, one of the ladies in our group. And what I did um, is I made a twined piece of fabric and um for this directly and then pressed clay into it so that i could kind of mimic some of those textile impressions i was talking about at the beginning and you can tell it's kind of funky after having been used with the clay and washed but it's still really sturdy it's um made out of stinging nettle and uh still looks great and it's got a little design in it you can't quite see it in there 
but um, pressing clay into it, you have this impression here. So um, that's what you see sometimes in the ceramics and the pots in the Southeast is this kind of impression. And you can see the design in it. So that looks kind of cool. And it was being functional. So you could cook in this. Um, sometimes people made salt with large pans, put water in it and kind of evaporated it so they could get salt. So um, lots of different ways to think about this. And you can make straps, you can make, so like all sorts of very functional tools. Or if you're out in the woods, you might as well just try some stocks and see what they can do. So um, don't be afraid to try things out. Obviously watching out for like, <laughs> poison ivy and other plants you don't want to mess with, but, or poison sumac, but, um, you know, uh, they, there's a lot of fibers out there that you might not realize are kind of hiding in your own backyard. So, um, even like hibiscus, um, stalks or other plants that, um, aren't native to the southeast, even if they're in your backyard, um, you can still try them out because they actually, there are lots of fibers or plants that produce fibers. And even if you live in a different part of the country, you can learn on them and, and use some of the same techniques and tools. So this is actually from um, hibiscus. Fine. So there's lots of materials you can use for these different techniques and use them in new, new modern ways. So I will, uh, I could talk textiles all day. <laughs> But um, that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And it's, um, I think, um, an experience where you, you learn a lot um, through each other. And, um, you know, I uh, plan to keep, keep going with our group and we'll see where it goes. So thanks everyone for getting on and for your questions. And, um, you know, uh, start looking for fibers and leaf plants um, and stock plants that you could use um, for, for making your own cordage and whatnot. So, right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for joining us today. Um, this is wonderful. And I hope everyone starts doing textiles. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. Um, and so our next Chata Tasholi is going to be about Chata social dancing. Um, and we will be joined again by Curtis Billy, along who um, he had a troupe of Choctaw social dancers. Like he just kind of gathered a bunch of his nieces and nephews. And so, and a lot of his students when he was a teacher in Broken Bow. Um, and so he's going to be joined with a couple of his students who are now themselves cultural educators. Um, and talking about kind of the history of Choctaw social dancing. And so that's going to be um, February uh, 4th <laughs> um, at 11 a.m. So join us again um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and thank you for joining us once again. Thanks, everyone.